All right, so I'm starting to record this. No one has popped into Zoom yet. Um, whoops, let me get my image here. So I'm rec re recording this, um, at, so it'll be up online. So generally, the purpose of the 093 course is to augment and help um, with the 143 course. So my job is to look at the problems you're having um, or not having the questions you might have, um, especially around the mathematics um, that will come into a statistics course. So I'm doing a lot of ums right now. Um, see there, there was another um, mm, right? uh, you learn speaking um, skills in a speech class and you will want to minimize these weird inflections. I'm not good at that. I'm not a speaking person. I, uh, I'm a write and type person. That said, okay, so 093 is to augment and help with the 143 class. Collectively, in, in statistics, there is a wide range of mathematics that gets used. And the skill sets coming in might not have touched all of that. And so the 093 highlights mathematics that will around the time you'll be seeing them in statistics and also take information that you're going to see in 143 and make sure it's good. Think of it as like a, a guided study hall. So it's really, really useful if I get questions from you because I can focus on the things you need help. And the questions can come from your 143 class. They can also come from um, the material in this class. There is material in this class. It is the homework. And the homework is on Pearson. I'm going to show a little bit of that right now. Um, and that walks through some of the mathematics you should have seen. And you want to struggle with it, if you struggle with it, to bring questions for it. If you're doing it okay, just be aware this is the mathematics um, that you'll be seeing in the statistics class. So that homework um, is a way of figuring out what we need to emphasize. I could teach an entire Foundations of Mathematics class to get us into st statistics, but A, this isn't four credit hours, it's one. B, a lot of you have a lot of these skills. They're just in different places. And so we use this as a place to flesh out the things um, coming across. It's very question-based. Bring me the problems you're having in Mat 143. Um, bring me the problems you're having with the review material that I'm putting through here and we, and I will post things for everyone um, to work on it. it the, the thing is you, you have to do all the homework, you have to do the quizzes that lets me know where things are, but not all the little lecture tidbits I put up will apply to you. Um, another ohm there. So that's what we want to use this for. It, it, it's a dialogue based course. You, um, you need to tell me what you're having problems with and I need to help you with those. And we need to do it before it pops up in Mat 143. And so, so today's first little tidbit, and I did it in my live class because I, I do this with students in front of me. And when they bring any particular questions, I'll also bring them in here. Um, and so what, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover that same material since there are no specific questions. But realize this is a space for you to get answers for your 143, to, to organize your information. Um, to flesh out the details that you might not have time for in the other class. All right, so I'm going to flip over here to, I have a blackboard, oh, wait, I want to flip over here, see if I can show it in Zoom, share screen, I'm gonna, I don't want that, two seconds, I don't want that, cancel, there we go. So in the Zoom world, I just want to show you my screen. Let's see if that'll let me do it. All right. So this is the class. This is Blackboard. The syllabus info, and again, I showed this in the in the other lecture, has um, two pieces of information in it. It has the course syllabus and the registration for my stat lab. Um, in my this registration information is the link to Pearson and the course ID. If we look over on the Pearson site, which I'm going to pull up now, and we come into I have multiple classes. And I want to put this into student view. Give me a second here. I do apologize for that. 
you will have a calendar with things due. And different things will pop up into here as they're available to, um, to, to be due. The next set of homework is going to be due. And this is information that we can work through. There will be a combination of quizzes and homework um, that just let us me know where we're at and we adapt to it. All of the homework you can go back and redo. So if you get a 72 on the homework and you want to do better, you can go back and redo it. All I say is keep up on the homework so that we are conversationally in the place that needs to be. And if you're struggling with any homework, bring in questions because these are things that will help us with the MAT 143 course. All right. So those are the two places. You have your Blackboard and you have Pearson. So I'll stop sharing that. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to switch over now to a Blackboard and I'm going to talk for a little bit about what's going on. So one of the things that we have mathematically, and I'll try to put a video link up by it. There's a great TED Talk a TEDx talk on why X is the unknown. And the variable X has been an unknown since about the 1200s, maybe a little bit earlier, 1000s. So about 1200 years. Textbooks have used X as the unknown thing. And this is a cultural transition. It started in the Persian uh, empires and the original Islamic caliphates that spread out um, with the Moorish invasions. It brought the knowledge to Spain. Um, and when the Moors left Spain and southern um, Europe, uh, a lot of the monks in the Catholicism that spread out and was really the hold of the Holy Roman Empire translated a book on algebra and algebra is algebra is a rough syllabic of arabic for the means of reconciling disparate parts and so when we mean disparate parts we have something on one side and something on the other side and we reconcile them by bringing the parts together and figuring out what the unknown thing is. Now, in the original Arabic, this was written in sentences, and so the unknown thing was called al Shin. And when the Spanish tried to translate al Shin, um, the sh sound isn't really in ancient Spanish. It's in modern Spanish. It wasn't in ancient Spanish, just like there are sounds that aren't in English. And they didn't have a letter for it. So they went to the Greek, and they grabbed this letter called Chi or Chi, depending on how you pronounce your Greek. And they put that for al Sheen, the unknown thing. And so X became the unknown thing. Uh, well, Chai became, chi, uh, became the unknown thing. Um, chai. I do, I, I'm a Chai guy in, in how I pronounce my Greek. And the unknown thing came across. And when it got translated into Latin text, became X. And so around, you know, the, uh, kind of right before the Battle of Hastings, 1040-ish, these monks translated it. And wherever we saw unknown things, we use X. And the modern form of algebra kind of built up around that. All these symbols came through through time, but X means the unknown thing. And so the thing we want to start getting comfortable with is variables have kind of two functions. I can have um, the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Each of these is a label for a thing I can measure. And if I know my mass is 10 kilograms and I know my acceleration, whoops, is 9.8 meters per second squared, it's gravity, then I know my force. I can replace these unknowns with what I went and measured. and I multiply them together and I get 98 kilograms meters per second squared. I know what my force is. I can take what I know and plug it into what I don't know and it formulates an answer for me. Um, and that's called a formula. That's not algebra per se. Algebra says I don't know the value of something
but there is a system where I can reconcile the different sides and in this case figure out x equals 1. So we're, we're going to use symbols to represent our level of knowledge of something that's mathematical. It, it becomes a box that we put things in and we can put things in that box um, and use it. Now there is a wide range of things we could measure in statistics. Um, statistics can be is an observational thing so anything in the world I can try to measure. I can try to discern the truth on many things. And you should have seen in your statistics class there's two types of data. There's population data and there is sample data. And so this has to do with where we got the data from and what that means. And um, let me pull it up here. We have to use these things slightly differently. If you have everything, certain mathematical things will come out of it. Um, and so what we want to do is sometimes distinguish between population and sample data, right? So population data, I have everything. I'm able to count or measure every unit of my of the population I, I, I want to deal with. Sample data, I have a subset of a population. I'm looking at a population, but I can only count a part of it. And so what tendency is when we talk about the counts in a population, we use a big N to count all the members. And we use a little n in a sample to count all the members. That's a way of keeping track of where we are. But what becomes really important, there are some mathematical formulae where we can look at different parts of the data we're seeing. We can look at its spread. We can look at its um, where the middle is. And in chapter 2 of your MAT 143, we do this. Um, but when we do it with the population, sometimes the formula is similar but slightly different than what it is for a sample. So this book and a lot of statistics courses decide to use different symbols for the same idea but recognizing what type of data we do. And the general is with population data, we use Greek variables. We're going to use Greek variables. And for sample data, we use the Roman alphabet. Right. And the Roman alphabet is the alphabet we're, we're, we're used to using now, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And Greek variables um, are different are from the Greek language. There's only 24 Greek letters and not all of them get used in statistics. What I have found is knowing their names help. Um, I, I remember um, when I was 37 and went back to school, I was doing some mathematics and I kept seeing this. And I knew it represented the angle, um, but I didn't know what it was called. And sometimes it'd be capital and sometimes I would have this. And these were Greek letters. And I found by knowing the name, knowing this was theta, and knowing this was capital theta, and this was lowercase omega, meant when I was struggling with a piece of paper, my brain had something to call it. Um, what will happen is you'll be reading a textbook, you know the concept, and you hit this squiggle. And your brain's going, you know, this squiggle which represents angle, um, is equal to four times this other squiggle that represents angle. There's a big translational thing that, that your brain has to do. But if I learn the name, I go, oh, theta um, from this triangle is equal to two times theta from the other triangle. And by giving its name, it, it just gives us a space in my brain to, to hold it. And so what I like to do, knowing that we're going to have this separation, that we're going to talk about population with Greek variables, and we're going to talk about samples with Roman alphabet, is I like just having names for Greek variables so that your brain doesn't go through that extra work when reading it. So I'm going to write the Greek alphabet and give its names. I have this paper up there. Um, this paper is on Blackboard. I'm going to write them so you can see some of the writing construct on them. 
and I think you can see where we got the word alphabet from the first two Greek letters. And there's a cursive nature to these. In fact, the capitals tend to have a block form and the lowercase tend to have a cursive. Um, I haven't studied Greek history enough to know why they did the difference. And some of them are visually very, very similar to the Roman correspondence. Uh, uh, lowercase zeta, zeta is really hard to read. You curl back and you come down and you give it a twirl. And that's not quite right. There's some that are really hard for me to write because A, I'm left-handed, and they're definitely built around a right-handed um, mentality. I'm just going to keep doing it and doing these. So this is alpha, this is beta, this is gamma, this is delta, this is epsilon, this is zeta. And then I'm going to have eta, which is eta, h. You know, you really old English said h. And eta is like a, looks like that. Capital theta is a big with a bold middle. And lowercase theta is that, so it's theta. I'm going to continue down just so, so you see this right, and then I'm going to show you how the how we use these in statistics. Iota, little iota, kappa, lambda. Mu. It's funny when a mu is one that you see early on in mathematics. You're going to see mu a lot. And when I first started writing this, I thought it was like a u. And then when someone told me, "Oh no, it's the Greek M," and I saw the capital, I now look at this and it looks like a sloppy cursive M. Mu. I try to mu and mu can look alike cursively. Um, I find u looks more like a, a, a v than a u. And I'm going to come up here. Um, so after nu, I, I have um, c. I worked with a physicist that worked at Los Alamos, and they said at Los Alamos everyone called um, c um, squiggle. They, they could never remember the name of it, so they would just say um, Squiggle. Omicron. Capital pi and lowercase pi. And that's kind of what I mean about the lowercase have, have, have a script form to it. And you're like going like, do I have to learn Greek here? He's writing down all these things. Do I have to learn it? No. But you have a table for it. And when you see these things coming up, it will you will find it's really good for your brain to give a name to it. Um, I struggled with this for about a year in my math courses, and I sat down and looked at these. I never learned, I, I can't go alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, theta, a, um, theta, iota, mu, or kappa mu nu, or kappa lambda mu nu, um, c, omicron, pi, rho, sigma, tau, um, phi, chi, c, omega. I just can't do it. I'm looking at it for the last part of it there. But there are things that I come back and use all the time. Um, and again, in the statistics class, I'm going to highlight the ones that pop up a lot. That's tau. That's capital phi. That's lowercase v. Almost done. There's only 24 of them. There's capital chi. There's lowercase chi. There's capital psi. There's lowercase psi, and there's omega. Okay. The Bible, I am the alpha, I am the omega, I'm from the beginning to the end, uh, because of the Greek alphabet. And so what we want to do here is we just want to, ones you're going to see and why you're going to see them. So occasionally, I want to start up a, so these are here, that's how we squirrely them. I'm going to start a new page up here, I'm just going to come up. And I'm going to clear this out and start a new page. And I want to highlight the ones that um, we use the most. So 
in mathematics you'll see the lowercase delta used sometimes like if I have a end point and a beginning point and I look at the difference between the two I call delta and I'll underline the D for distance um, theta gets used for angles so in trigonometry or rotations theta also gets used a lot in statistics as just a in place of X um, but a lot of times it's for angle and that's because it looks like a circle cut in half and your angles go around a circle they actually pick something visually um, there are reasons for these lowercase mu is probably the first one you're going to see lowercase mu in statistics is used for the mean or average right we're going to say mean and so they picked the M for mean and so it's going to be used for a population mean we're going to use lowercase mu for a population mean we're going to use X bar for a sample mean now one of the things that happens um, so if you go online you go to Khan Academy you go to other places and you try to um, look these up you will see sometimes people use this also for a sample mean this textbook uses that um, pi uppercase pi means I'm going to multiply a lot of things together this gets used in probability when we say multiplication we say products and so uppercase pi is used for that um, I think we might do it once or twice in probability and I'll point it out when we do it but in general uppercase pi is used for products multiplying a lot of things together um, and lowercase pi is a mathematical constant so it tends not to get used much outside of that um, sigma is the one that's going to come up a lot sigma in an uppercase we do for multiple sums if I add a lot of things together I'm going to use sigma notation for sums and so they picked s lowercase and that's sample or population it's an operation and I'll show you that in a second lowercase sigma is the population standard deviation Again, you'll learn these terms going back and forth. What I want you to understand is why you're seeing weird symbols and what the difference is and the difference has a meaning. And then in for a sample standard deviation, we use S. So Roman alphabet for sample, Greek um, for population and also we're going to see chi there's a distribution called chi squared that we use it's um how numbers are set in a pattern and so that's the weird symbols that you see i'm going to introduce you to, to sigma notation in the context of means so if i have three numbers and i want to take their average and we'll say this is the population this is everything I have. So I want to average them. I'm going to take the mean. Now, to save us from writing a lot of things and to deal with the fact that I could have three things, I could have 800 things, we're going to say I want to take the sum of my variables. And I want to divide it by the number of things in my population. And so the sigma notation here is saying I'm going to add the first variable I have plus the second variable I have plus the third until I run out of them. Now I only have three. Now the calculation of figuring out my mean is I add all the variables I have and I divide by the number of things I have, which in this case is going to be three. This Greek one is telling me it's a population. I have everything. And so this becomes 90 plus 72 plus 86 divided by 3. And if I run to my calculator here, 90 plus 72 plus 86 is 245. Divide that by 3. 
and 81.6 repeating. So I have a little bit of Greek that you're going to see pop up now and again telling me this is a population, not a sample. And a Greek, big capital Greek to tell me I'm doing some operation. And it's only the sigma one that we're going to see a lot and it means add everything up. And in this case, if I were dealing with a sample, if those three things came from a sample, I would use X bar to say a sample, but I'm still going to do this operation of adding everyone up and divide by the number of things I have. Now, I, when I do this, I don't do it like the book. I put a little I down here to say I need to do this on each piece of data. And that's the little marker thing I did here is I'm saying this X represents the first thing in my data. This one represents the second thing in my data. And this one represents the third thing in my data. And so I, I hope in this that we're going to see that we're going to have to use variables to talk about things. And we're going to have to use variables to talk about a lot of things. And so what we're going to do is we're going to let our notation take care of that. And so when we talk about population things, we're going to use Greek variables where possible. And we have this multiple additions that we can write with the sigma notation. All right, then we'll practice that as we come through. All right, that's everything I've talked about so far. Bring me your questions. Work on the homework. Get a feel for what you need to do. If you have anything you need in the MAT143, email me. If you have anything you need in here, email me. This is a question-based um, interactive form of this. Doodle -doodle.